Welcome back, folks, to WrestleRant, where I give my in-depth analysis of all the pay-per-views that I watch on the WWE Network. No better way to kick off the month of December if you were on WrestleRant than with my review of the December to Dismember pay-per-view, arguably the worst WWE pay-per-view of all time. Watched it for the very first time on the WWE Network only a couple days ago. So I'm going to break it down for you here right now, because I've had a few people say to me, well, I don't know if it was truly the worst pay-per-view of all time. I had a few good matches. We're going to debate that and all the aftermath and everything that came after it after I review this show. But kicking off the show is the Hardy Boys versus Team Eminem, Joey Mercury, and Johnny Nitro with Molina in their corner. The reuniting faction, the Hardy Boys reuniting for the first time in an ECW pay-per-view for the first time in, I think, 2006. Um, I think Jeff Hardy had just come back to the company, reunited with his brother Matt from SmackDown. So uh, Eminem and the Hardys had a great series of matches over the course of 06 and 2007. I believe they would clash also at the Royal Rumble and No Way Out pay-per-views in 07 as well. But uh, their matches were always very enjoyable. The tag team division at the time was really nothing to behold. But uh, this was a very, very good match to kick off the show. Even though it really had nothing to do with ECW whatsoever. I mean, like I said before, Jeff was Raw, Matt was SmackDown, and uh, neither of, and none of the members of Eminem were on, on ECW. So uh, it really made absolutely no sense. But uh, I, I, despite that, though, I thought it was a very, very good match and a great way to kick off the show. Um, with a stellar tag team match going over 20 minutes long, a lot of entertaining action. But the only gripe against it is the fact that it had really nothing to do with ECW whatsoever. So it uh, really had no place on this pay-per-view. They probably just threw it on here just to add some extra spice to this show. Because without it, this, place, this show would have, been, would have been a flaming pile of shit. And it already was without it, but uh, with it, not even this match could save the show. But Anyway, up next we had Balls Mahoney versus Matt Stryker in a match where it was Stryker's Rules, where he said, it's going to be Extreme Rules, it's going to be a Stryker's Rules match, where he couldn't do certain things and all this other bullshit. It was like a seven-minute match. Um, I like Matt Stryker as a commentator, as a wrestler. He never really did anything for me. Balls Mahoney, I know he has the you know the fans my, uh, the, the fans appeal stuff like that. He was popular, but he also was never the world's greatest worker. Putting these two together was kind of a mistake. The whole strikers rule thing, the whole the, the whole strikers rule thing, uh, only dragged down the match. And had it without it, without the strikers rules thing, it would have been a bad match anyway. But with it, it kind of dragged it down. What it was already a mediocre matchup. No one really cared. Balls Mahoney was over, like I said before, but it was so stupid, the rules and stuff like that. Got seven minutes of in-ring time, longer than it should have. Balls Mahoney went over, thank God. But uh, just just a dumb match, to say the least. Up next, we had Elijah Burke and Sylvester Turkai taking on the full-blooded Italians, the FBI, Little Guido, and Tony, and Tony Marmaluke with uh, Trinity in their corner. So I thought this was a decent matchup. Um, Elijah Burke, I was always a huge fan of in TNA and in, in, in WWE. I was never really exposed to him all that much because, like I said before, um, or like I've said every in every single video I ever do on this channel, um, I started watching in April of 2008. So, um, and I think Burke left in November of 08, and he never was. I think he had like maybe one or two appearances in April and May of that year before being taken off TV completely. So, uh, being off TV never really helped him. Uh, never helped me get more accustomed to his work, and I didn't really. Um, become more exposed to the Elijah Burke character until he jumped ship to uh, TNA about a year later or so, I think in late 2009. So I really liked Elijah Burke. I always thought he had a lot of potential. Um, I thought I think he had a bad attitude backstage, which is what kind of cost him his push. Uh, CM Punk has never really had fond things to say about Elijah Burke. But uh, still, though, I didn't really mind this match. It was kind of an enhancement match for Elijah Burke. And Sylvester Turkai never really was exposed to before this match. I know they were together at one point. Um, but he was never really anything special, hence why they eventually got him out of the act and they just kept Elijah Burke on his own, leading the uh, the new blood, not the new blood, the what, what the fuck was it called? The uh, the young talents, whatever the fuck it was called, I, I can't remember. The uh, the new faction of Kevin Thorne and Matt Stryker that had in, I can't fucking believe what what the name of it was. For the life of me, I can't remember. Someone can hopefully point it out in the comments section. But uh, yeah, Elijah Burke would leave that stable in uh, 2007 going to WrestleMania and all that kind of stuff. Um, but still, though, decent matchup, but the focus wasn't even on the matchup because before this, we were shown a vignette backstage of Sabu getting attacked and subsequently taken out of the arena, leaving him unable to compete in the main event. Paul Heyman would later recruit Hardcore Holly to take his place. Um, Hardcore Holly was originally supposed to be in the chamber match before Bobby Lashley took his spot. So uh, I'll talk about that when I get to it, but that was fucking dumb, and people chanted bullshit throughout this entire match because of that. 
But um, up next, we had Daivari defeating Tommy Dreamer. The matchup, again, about seven minutes long. Nothing special whatsoever. Great Kali and Daivari had just been switched from SmackDown to ECW for really no good reason because they were on Raw maybe all of two or three months after this. So um, I know, I think Great Kali did. I don't know if Daivari went with him. I can't remember exactly. But uh, still, though, this wasn't... I mean, Great Kali took out Tommy Dreamer after the matchup and a pretty impressive powerbomb on the, on the stage afterwards. But again, it really meant nothing when uh, you have this mini feud between Dreamer and Kali that lasted maybe all of a month before Kali was on Raw anyway, so it really served no fucking purpose. But um, yeah, fine matchup. Again, very forgettable. Up next, we had Kevin Thorne and Ariel taking on Mike Knox and Kelly Kelly. So at least this matchup had a story behind it in that um, Mike Knox and Kelly Kelly were kind of that dysfunctional couple. Kelly Kelly was after CM Punk at the time. Mike Knox was that very protective boyfriend. So they had that story going for them. Kevin Thorne and Ariel, they were an, an interesting act, I guess, to say the least, but none of these guys in this matchup. Kelly Kelly sucked. Mike Knox sucked. Kevin Thorne sucked. And Ariel sucked. All of these people in this match were not good wrestlers and it did not make for a very good match at all. Especially considering the fact that Mike Knox would ditch um, Kelly Kelly during the course of this contest after get, uh, wishing CM Punk good luck before this matchup. She took the mic behind his back. Wish CM Punk good luck in the main event. Mike Knox would get pissed at that, leaving Kelly Kelly for dead in this contest, getting a, getting beaten by Kevin Thorne and Ariel. So, that was that. And um, then we get to the main event. Extreme Elimination Chamber match, where each participant will have a, an extreme weapon to bring into the matchup. So, it pitted Bobby Lashley, the then ECW champion, the big show, Rob Van Dam, Hardcore Holly, CM Punk, and Test. Okay, so taking Sabu out of the mix, this pay-per-view is doomed to fail from the start, but to take out the fan favorite uh, CM Punk, or to take out the fan favorite fan favorite Sabu before the matchup even started was a kiss of death for this matchup because so many people were so excited to see him perform in this contest, and he got taken out before it could even begin. So that was kind of bullshit, and a lot of people were not very happy about that, unsurprisingly, and Hardcore Holly took his spot. So the whole story here was that Paul Heyman was trying to stack the get that was trying to stack the odds against Bobby Lashley to ensure that he did not win the ECW title. The only issue is that Test Hardcore Holly and the Big Show would not work together. Test, upon entering the elimination chamber, would eliminate Hardcore Holly, with Hardcore Holly doing next to nothing inside the chamber, and his involvement in this contest was pretty much meaningless. Meaning that Sabu probably could have done something ten times more extreme, and it could have meant so much more to this matchup to make it more memorable. So Hardcore Holly pretty much proved to be worthless in this contest, and by 2006, no one really gave a shit about Hardcore Holly if they ever did to begin with. So that was pretty pointless. Um, the rest of this matchup, it had its moments. RVD was RVD and, and Hardcore Holly. And, uh, well, Hardcore Holly's elimination was pretty much pointless because why even have the match? Why even have the guy in the match to begin with? So that was fucking dumb. As for CM Punk, his involvement was a really interesting one because I'll get to this right now. Because I guess after the event, or I, I think about a year and a half later, Paul Heyman would reveal in an interview that CM Punk, upon entering the elimination chamber, would quickly eliminate the Big Show, putting him over big time. The Big Show was all in favor of it. CM Punk loved the idea. Paul Heyman loved the idea. Who wouldn't love the idea? Vince McMahon, that's who, that's who didn't love the idea, so that was turned down, CM Punk, instead of uh, right off the bat eliminating the big show, would be instead the first one eliminated, so uh, CM Punk got the uh, got the boot right off the bat, RVD did not do much of note in this contest, he had a few highlights here and there, but he would also be quickly eliminated, it came down to test Big Show and Bobby Lashley. Bobby Lashley would predictably overcome the odds, taking out Test, taking out the Big Show, and being crowned the new ECW champion. Now, nothing against Bobby Lashley, but uh, they obviously had a hard-on for this guy because he was big. That's the only real reason why they pushed him, because he sucked on the mic, so why they ever put a mic to his mouth, I have no idea. But um, I'm, a, I'm a Bobby Lashley fan. I think he's very impressive in the ring. By now, I mean, in 2014, I know this is eight, year, eight years later, but he's come a long way in the ring. He's had very good matches in TNA this past year. But in 06, um, I could see why they would put him on the C brand to kind of push him as the next big thing. And maybe that would have worked in the newer ECW and about, I mean, this technically was a new ECW, but I'm talking about like the role that Christian had and Matt Hardy had. Like, I understand that. But to give the title to a guy that was had nothing to do with ECW and Big Show didn't either. But the biggest difference between Lashley and Big Show was that because Big Show was not an ECW guy, that was the whole part of his championship reign. He was big. He was a monster. People fucking hated him when he won the title and he screwed over RVD. That was the whole point. 
So, um, Bobby Lashley was not that guy. He was a non-ECW guy. He was a babyface. People booed him in this matchup. No one gave a shit. No one really wanted to see him as champion. Did he make a good champion? Absolutely. But the, 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 the move to have him, the, the, the decision to have him win this contest was a dumb one. Because people booed it. People didn't like it. And it really set off the, it ended the show on a very sour note. Even though we got a new champion for the first time in five months, the, comment tried, the, the, the commentators, Joey Styles and Taz, Tried to act surprised. They were kind of funny on the show for the most part. They were kind of it kind of came off to me like one of those TNA one ed only pay per views where the commentators do not give a shit at all. Both which involved Taz, by the way, so maybe he's the common denominator in all this. But uh, that was a really disappointing matchup because I thought it was going to be a lot better than it actually was. The booking of it was just what kind of uh, kind of threw me for a loop to begin with. But Paul Heyman, uh, you know, he and Vince McMahon, all the aftermath, you can read it on Wikipedia yourself and following in other interviews and other websites and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, he was pissed off the creative direction of ECW. Vince McMahon would take him off the creative uh, side of ECW altogether. He would completely walk out on WWE, never to return his contract. He would still be under contract with the company until it would expire a short time later. And he just basically quit after this pay-per-view. He was never seen again on WWE TV up until 2012 when he made his return as the advocate for Brock Lesnar again. And um, as for CM Punk, he would be battling an uphill battle for the next nine months until he won the ECW championship because they didn't... Paul Heyman was the only back... He was the only guy backing CM Punk at that, at that point in time. So he lost its supporter on Paul Heyman that night because Paul Heyman was gone from the company. That obviously did not bode well for CM Punk. And Tommy Dreamer and uh, Stevie Richards, obviously, with how uh, poorly received that pay-per-view where it was, they uh, requested their releases from the WWE only to be declined of that, and they would stick around in WWE being poorly mistreated and uh, all this other bullshit that's being treated as jobbers and all this other garbage for the next two to three years. So that was really pointless to keep them under contract, too. Why not just let them go? Like, what the fuck? But, um, yeah, everyone really shit on this pay-per-view. It's widely remembered as one of the, you know, no, uh, no pun there. Uh, no pun intended with December to December, whatever. Um, it's widely remembered as one of the worst WWE pay-per-views of all time. And like I said earlier on in the video, someone brought it to my attention not too long ago. Do you really think that December to December is one of the worst pay-per-views of all time? And it is. It absolutely is. This was not a pay-per-view. This was a glorified episode of ECW. The matches were not good. The only good match from the show was the opener. And the Extreme Rules match, the Elimination Chamber, had its moments for the, for the most part, though. It was pretty disappointing with how it was booked. The action was good. The action was enjoyable. But the way it was booked was very mind-boggling to me. Um, the only match, the single one and only match that you should go out of your way to watch from the show was the opener between uh, Eminem and the Hardy Boys. But they would have another series of great matches going to, 20, going to 2007. So you can go watch one of those matches if you want. It doesn't really matter. Um, but absolutely do not go out of your way to watch this pay-per-view. Unless it's one of those things that it's so bad it's good, but... Um, I think it's maybe like a two-hour and 20-minute pay-per-view. I can't recall exactly. It was nowhere near being three hours. But um, absolutely do not waste your time on this pay-per-view if you feel like you don't have to. Um, it's very oddly booked. It was kind of the beginning of the end for the ECW brand as extreme championship wrestling before becoming just another show. And by this point, it was kind of becoming that, but it was Paul Heyman's last show, so it was kind of notable for that, a new ECW champion being crowned. But um, it would be the first and only exclusive ECW pay-per-view before they merged the brands together and they completely scrapped the idea of another December 2 member pay-per-view due to how bad the, the buy rate was and everything else about it, the, the fan feedback and all this other bullshit, and rightfully so because it was not a good show. So, uh, yeah, those are my thoughts on the December 2 December pay-per-view. If you want to go watch it, by all means, go right ahead, but I would not suggest that you do, and I would not recommend it. But uh, like I said before, check out the opener. Everything else is just complete shit. Um, I definitely back up the other arguments. I definitely share the other sentiments of other fans that saw this show. But uh, in my next WrestleMania video, I'll be talking about the 2009 installment, the inaugural event in uh, WWE TLC history. Not the match itself, but there was a TLC match on that show. But uh, the first ever TLC pay-per-view from 2009. I'll be talking about that in my next WrestleRant video, so make sure to stay tuned for that. But in the meantime and in between time, you can find me on Facebook at Graham Jason Matthews, on Twitter at WrestleRant. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. All support is greatly appreciated. And in the meantime, folks, I'm Graham Jason Matthews, and I'll catch you guys next time.